Hey everybody, Pastor Hink here from Northwest Free Methodist Church and I have a good friend with me, Lynn Andrews, uh, attends our church and uh, she graciously offered her expertise as we face these times of wondering about viruses and what's going on with the pandemic. And so uh, I'm going to let Lynn introduce herself and tell a little bit about what her expertise are and um, what she can help us learn because I think information helps us uh, be on a better footing to, to address this stuff. So tell us a little bit about your education and okay. what you do for a living. Okay, well, um, I was a high school biology, AP biology anatomy teacher for 18 years. And then just in the past year, I have taken a position with the National Center for Science Education. And what that means is I'm working as the director of teacher support, trying to make sure that sound science is being shared throughout the United States and, and hopefully beyond. But um, our biggest goal is to make sure that misinformation is not getting into classrooms about very important topics. Which is really timely because everybody's talking about coronavirus and there's all kinds of stuff on the internet right now. Oh yeah, and um, in fact, I've been doing a weekly update for teachers that are part of my um, newsletter, giving them fact versus fiction information about COVID-19 and things that are happening um, both on the social networks and even in the media, there's a lot of uh, misinformation because everybody wants to know everything very, very quickly. And the scientists are doing everything they can to get that information out there very quickly. However, the answers aren't coming in fast enough. So people are filling in the blanks when they might not necessarily need to be. Yeah. So people are kind of jumping to conclusions and, yes. it's, and it's a little dangerous. It, it, it can be. A uh, really good example of that is we keep talking about um, how deadly is this virus. Mm. Those are uh, questions that can't possibly be answered with any sort of uh, definitiveness right now. Um, you're dealing with a, a, a virus that has just made its appearance as of January, um, started in December, but started to be figuring out by January. And it's going to take at least one to two years to get the full picture. Mm. When SARS broke out back in 2003, um, they're still working on understanding SARS and it's 2020. So you can't just make this leap that we're gonna have all the answers tomorrow. So one of the things that might help us, I've been referring to this as COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Although in the press, on the internet, a lot of people just call it the coronavirus. Right. But there are multiple coronaviruses, yes. correct? Yes. We have coronaviruses uh, that have been in our population for years. Um, there's some that are very common. They don't cause us any trouble. Um, there's some that only are found in animals and don't make the leap over to humans. Uh, but then every once in a while, we'll have a virus that starts from an animal host, goes through a series of intermediates, possibly, sometimes not, sometimes it can jump directly into human transmission, and it's something about that particular virus makes it more um, virulent than other mm. variations. Um, so when we say COVID-19, there's at least 19 versions because mm. you don't get to that number <laughs> until there's been others before it. Um, and then on top of that, a lot of things that people aren't hearing is that it's actually SARS-2-COVID-19, which means that it is a SARS-like coronavirus of the family of SARS-like coronaviruses, which all of the information we have right now says that that particular set of coronaviruses originated in bats from Asia. Mm. Whether or not it was this particular market, whether or not it was a different market, the reality is somewhere um, along the line, a bat's feces most likely uh, ended up in food of animals that we consume. Um, and then made the leap into us through some sort of series of events. So that, that leads me to one of my other questions, because you hear people saying, you know, I think the Chinese engineered this to attack us, or I've heard recently the Chinese saying that we, the United States, right. engineered it to attack them, <laughs> but it doesn't work that way, really, with viruses, does it? Well, y can a virus be engineered? Um, of course, anything can be engineered these days. I mean... 
we're to the point where we're getting into a really crazy time in life where you can uh, use CRISPR to edit genes yeah, and, yeah. and fix things and modify things. And we're not even ready for that conversation yet. But <laughs> when you talk about biowarfare, um, the first thing you have to keep in mind is that why would China be the largest zone of deaths if they were engineering it as some sort of bioweapon for us, they would have been much more careful with their virus. Um, because uh, I don't... If they knew it was a weapon, yeah, they wouldn't have used it like, on their own people. They would yeah. not be, like, infecting their own to do a cover-up. That that would not yeah. have happened. And, um, and so every scientific group out there has come forward and said unanimously, this was not bioengineered. We mm -hmm. have to trust our scientific community. And that's one of the things that con concerns me the most. As a science teacher and a science educator, the lack of trust that we have for our scientists can be very detrimental, especially during times like this. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, okay, that brings me to the next thing. For people out there that are getting on Facebook or they're getting on Twitter and they're seeing things that are posted, how can they differentiate between something that's just sensational or even fake news versus something that is scientifically sound? Where would be the places to go for that kind of information? There's so many jokes I want to make right now. <laughs> I was like, is it on the internet? Check. Turn it off. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, but seriously, um, you have to be using sources that are vetted by the scientific community, like the CDC, like the WHO. Um, even though I know we all have our favorite news channel, they're releasing news reports before they have all the facts because mm. they're trying to make sure all the information that we can get is out there as fast as possible. The issue with that, though, is look at the side effects of that. They say, oh, this is going to get worse. People rush out and, you know, we're hoarding and mm -hmm. we're... We're, we're stocking up like zombies are about to appear. Um, and so it's crazy because that was unnecessary. But because the media is trying to make sure we're informed, people are hearing certain things and, and they process it like, I've got to do something right now. I have to have some control. And this is the only thing I control. I can buy this. I can control that. But, um, yeah. And so it's our way of dealing with the crisis, this need to feel safe, since we can't really protect ourselves from something like a virus in the first place. But if you're going to websites like the WHO and the CDC, this is where the scientific community is putting all of their efforts, and they're going to have the most, the most recent, the newest information that is actually viable. A really good example of how the media can jump the gun is that they tried, not tried, that's the wrong word, but when they were giving out information, they said that the pangolin was the one that carried mm -hmm. it. Well, yeah, here's the that. issue. Um, a scientific study of a portion of the genome matched a pangolin 99%, but not the entire genome. But because they targeted one protein section, it was a 99% match. And then it was all over the media. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, it's the 9%, it's the pangolin, pangolin. Well, you've got a big issue when you do something like that because the pangolin is an extremely endangered creature. Mm -hmm. uh, all eight species of pangolin are on the either critically endangered, endangered, or threatened list right. because of poaching. Um, a lot of medicine, um, uh, herbal remedies, and things like that call for pangolin scales, especially coming out of the um, Asian cultures. And if you scare people into thinking the pangolin is dangerous, people are going to just butcher them. And they're almost already wiped out anyway from other things. <laughs> And that happened with civets back during SARS. Civets mm. is a, a weasel-like animal that was, uh, they started killing them in, in just batches mm -hmm. because they thought it was what carried SARS. And I mean, was there a connection to the civet and SARS? Yes. But actually, SARS originated most likely from a camel. So it's another one of those situations where you've got people jumping the gun and, and making bad choices. Yeah. <clears throat> so... When we talk about a virus, one last thing I just wanted to touch on, because I, I understand this a little bit. I know enough to differentiate it, but a virus is not the same as a bacteria. No. They're, they're, they're different things. And your antibacterial soap, I mean... <laughs> it's not made for viruses. It isn't made for viruses. <laughs> the name bacteria and, should give that away. And, 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 you know, another thing we know is, I know is antibiotics work on bacteria. They don't work on viruses. So Correct. It, it, explain a little bit of how that's different and, and how a virus works for 
a sixth grade level to understand. Okay. So, um, one of the things that you really have to think about when you're talking about viruses versus bacteria, and you know, I am a teacher, so I have to do a little visual. Can, yeah, this is great. Yeah. So I have two viruses. I have chicken pox. Um, and hey, let, let, let me hold chicken pox. I'm, <laughs> I'm familiar with that one. And, and it's varicella. Uh, I never say it right, but I'll, I'll give you it. Varicella. Varicella zoster virus. Yeah. And then we have my favorite, the bird flu. And um, not really my favorite, just to be clear. But this one always amuses me because it looks like a bird. Um, versus our two bacterial versions. I have listeria and pneumonia. And so when we're dealing with these different types of organisms, the first thing you have to understand is that there are many in the scientific community who don't even think viruses are actually what we would define as living. When you talk about the characteristics of life, you can't check all the boxes on mm, viruses. You can check all the viruses on bacteria. All the boxes for, it's for a, it's bacteria alive. is a living It is a thing. cellular yeah. creature. Okay. The simplest of all the cellular creatures, but yeah. uh, it is a cellular creature. And antibiotics are made to attack them in many different ways. Um, okay. So there's a whole conversation you can have there about how antibacterials work on bacteria. But nothing antibacterial is made to work on a virus. The only thing that can really help with viruses is making sure that you're not coming into contact with someone who has the virus. So really your body is the best thing to fight a virus, not... A medicine there's or... no I mean I have been seeing so much crap out there about do this drink salt water yeah nope <laughs> uh, drink water nope um, none of those remedies that you're hearing about work there is no put an onion under the bed and you'll be cured the next day that's not how this kind of thing works right while it makes people feel like they are in control the reality is the reason that we are so put off by all of this is that we have very little control over what's going on. Yeah. And I know from this guy, varicella, so I had chicken pox as a child and the virus remains in my system. Uh, the antibodies that attacked the virus remains in your okay. system. Okay, so it's the so, antibodies that stay there. Right, and so if you have all these different types of antibodies, there's B cells, T cells, etc., but you have these kind of like memory cells that know something that's attacked you before. Uh, so then if you are exposed to the virus again, it doesn't mean the virus doesn't get into you. It means that you've already got your arsenal ready to go. So all this talk about washing hands, um, it's not a bacteria. So we know that antibacterial soap doesn't kill the virus. What's the significance of washing hands? Okay, so when we talk about a virus, the important thing to understand is that they're made out of basically two things. Um, they're made out of genetic material and proteins. That's what a virus is made from. And this particular virus, virus the coronavirus, gets its name because it kind of looks like it has a sun pattern. Yeah, of, it's like rays, mm -hmm, like and fingers those are the, sticking out. Those are the proteins. And soap is a lipid. Um, and lipids have hydrophobic and hydrophilic heads and tails. Okay, so this is kind of getting into some molecular biology, but what you need to understand is soap has the ability to surround the virus, and then as you lather your hands, you're actually tearing at those little proteins that stick out, which in turn can make the virus fall apart, and then as you wash it off of your skin, it, it literally is taking those pieces of virus with it and and, leaving, and you're just flushing and it, you're off, flushing of it off of your skin. Okay, okay. So washing hands, we've all heard it. It's really important and it actually works. It does. And um, one of the things that you really have to keep in mind is that it's actually the young that are more likely to transfer viruses amongst our, our um families because they're less likely to wash their hands properly. I, I mean, I have a daughter myself and for her to wash her hands for 20 seconds, she feels like it's pure torture. Um, yeah, that's a lifetime. It for is a, a lifetime for anybody yeah. that's below the age of like 10. And so um, they really don't get between their fingers. They definitely don't get beneath their nails. And then they go and they give grandma a big hug. She's more vulnerable to the virus the little girl or little boy is not going to get sick, but grandma is now infected. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So before we sign off, 
people that are hearing this going, you know, where else can I go? Are there, we've talked a little bit about some websites, but like uh, cdc.gov. Uh-huh, who.gov. Um, I've also been recommending people, you know, keep their eyes on the major newspapers and things like that. Um, but also keep in mind that they're going to report something very quickly uh, before it's necessarily been vetted by the scientific community. So whenever anyone's talking, and I don't care if it's a, a movie star, a politician, a news anchor, mm-hmm. if there is not or some... Or a pastor. Or, <laughs> or a biology <laughs> teacher. If there is not a scientific article attached to those facts, then you need to do more investigating before you start to click and spread more. It's kind of like some of the stuff on the social media is like a virus. People are spreading it. Um, A really good example is just last week, there was this thing going around saying, if you hold your breath for 10 seconds and you, (laughs) um, and you have no coughing, then you don't have the virus. That's rubbish. There, right. it's there's uh, yeah. no evidence to support that. And, and even credible stuff, because information is coming out so quickly and things are changing almost daily. Right. In what we know, uh, what was true last week might be modified. It might next change. Week. Yeah. And that's the thing. People want science to be something that's dependable and static, and that's why science is always such an area of controversy. Uh, science by its very nature is always changing. The only thing that ever stays the same is that nothing stays the same. Mm. And um, I always, I actually always quote, life is complicated, let's deal with it. It's on right my, behind my wall head. right behind us. And that's a biological molecule, and that's as simple as it gets, but it's still complicated. Still complicated. Yep. yep. Gotcha. Well, hey, Lynn, thanks for your time, and uh, thanks for helping us out. We're also going to try to put up some links to some graphs and things like that will help you understand, you know, the the transmissibility of this and the fatalities of this and things like that. And even those are evolving and we've got some numbers now that are certainly going to change in the days ahead, right? I would, I would definitely agree with that, especially when we talk about how virulent is it versus other viruses, what is the morbidity rate? Those numbers are constantly going to keep changing. And so there's no way to say this is the worst pandemic we're ever going to have. We're, we're nowhere near that right now. So All right. we hope and we hope Absolutely. we aren't. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Lynn. You're welcome. Have a great night. See you again on Facebook or in church when we're able to meet again.